Hi LEGO fans! It's been a long time coming, but I can leave this sealed in my vault no longer. Today, I'm going to be unboxing, speed building, and reviewing set number 76417, Gringotts Wizarding Bank, Collector's Edition, from LEGO Harry Potter! But that is not all. Oh no, that is not all. I'll be adding the 40598 Gringotts Vault Set, which adds an additional and exclusive minifigure. As well as checking out the action features, we'll be getting up close and personal with the minifigures and comparing them to their on-screen manifestations. We will of course be taking a detailed look at the exterior and interior features of Gringotts, plus the secrets which line the vaults beneath. We'll also be checking out the extra vault and the Ukrainian Iron Belly Dragon perched on top. And because it would be rude not to, let's see how this looks combined with the 2020 Diagon Alley set. With some historical facts along the way, we've got a lot to cover, so let's do this! 76417 Gringotts Wizarding Bank Collector's Edition is a 4,803 piece set and you are going to need to raid your vault at Gringotts to buy it. This bad boy retails for 370 Great British Pounds, 430 Euros or 430 US Dollars, giving a price to part ratio of 9 cents. That does sound a lot, but the 4,803 piece part count includes 13 minifigures, 12 of which are exclusive to this set. In a throwback to Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, we have itty bitty baby Harry Potter in his sun blue jacket. We also have Rubius Hagrid in a very familiar costume. The remaining 11 characters come from the Deathly Hallows movie. We've got Hermione Granger disguised as Bellatrix Lestrange, Ronald Weasley transformed into Dragomir Despard, an older version of the boy what Gondon lived with dark blue hoodie, and then we got some goblins. We have Griphook in a black pinstripe vest, Bogrod in a dark bluish grey pinstripe suit, Rickbert in a black tuxedo, and then we have a generic goblin with dark bluish grey hair, and a second goblin with dark orange hair. We also have a Death Eater wearing a black hood, a Gringotts guard with light nougat skin, and a Gringotts guard with medium brown skin. The box art is very minimalist and focuses mainly on the product. This set is designed for wizards over the age of 18, but as we know this is just a marketing ploy to get adults to buy expensive toys. It is a big package, but I do sense a little room inside the box for a little Danish air. That's always such a satisfying noise. The really neat thing about this set, which actually scares the hell out of me, is the way Gringotts is perched on top of the subterranean vaults. Over on the back of the box, we get to peek inside Gringotts for the first time. The level of detail doesn't seem to be over the top, but there's enough to recreate scenes from the first and the last movies. I sure hope Mr. Harry Potter remembered to bring his key. Very thoughtfully, LEGO has built the bank itself in the same scale as Diagon Alley. We will of course be checking out how that looks later in the video. As I mentioned before, this set is a bit of a beast. The set is 40cm or about 15.5 inches wide. With the Ukrainian Iron Belly perched on top, this stands 79cm or 27.5 inches tall. The Ukrainian Iron Belly, which looks freaking awesome, can be removed from the set. One of the more innovative features of this set is the minecart track which goes down to the vaults. LEGO has even included the Thief's Downfall which washes away all enchantments, but more on that later. Helping this to blend into your Diagon Alley, we actually have another shop attached. The Magical Menagerie has a wide range of cats, toads, and of course the indispensable Pygmy Puff. Weighing in at 6.7 kilos or 14.8 pounds, this is a bit of a beast. So was Gringotts worth the wait, excuse the pun? Let's find out! And so without knocking the overhead camera this time, here's everything you get inside the box. We've got 41 crinkly bags of Lego numbered for stages 1 through 31, a 32 by 32 dark grey base plate, a bag containing railway tracks, wheels and dragon wings, not one, not two, not three, but four instruction booklets, and not one, not two, but three sticker sheets. And trust me, this b about spreading Gringotts Bank across two stickers isn't lost on me. I'm going to go ahead and build the 76417 Gringotts Wizarding Bank Collector's Edition, and today this is going to be a 4 minute speed build!
And here is the completed 76417 Gringotts Wizarding Bank Collector's Edition from LEGO Harry Potter! Build time today was 12 hours 15 minutes and storing all of that 4K footage used just over 3 terabytes. Some parts of the build such as the white sidings of Gringotts got a bit tedious, but easter eggs along the way kept the build pretty varied and interesting. More on those later. One thing that was hard to ignore was the sheer volume of tan snot bricks. There are 99 1x4, 77 1x2 and 63 1x1 bricks mostly used to attach white tiles to the exterior of Gringotts. The finished build borders on intimidating when stacked like this. While the footprint is fairly compact, the height is nearly as impressive as this woman's afro from LEGO's promotional photographs. You don't have to display it like this, although if you do, I would recommend something like the Millsbow cabinet from IKEA. That's my current go-to for overpriced oversized sets. Gringotts Bank can be removed from the subterranean vault structure for easy display. The bank itself looks great as a standalone build, but I can't say so much for the vaults. The bank can also be combined with Diagon Alley, but more on that later. This is not the first time LEGO has brought Gringotts Bank to life, but it is by far the most movie accurate. The first iteration came in 2002 with the 4714 Gringotts Bank set. Interestingly, LEGO has included a few easter eggs from this set in the latest incarnation. A more aesthetically pleasing version came with the 10217 Diagon Alley set in 2021. This is one of my favourite Harry Potter sets from throughout the years and quite valuable with a used price of $235, thanks in part to the unique Weasley Twins minifigures. The interior is a little sparse and LEGO still has a long way to go with the creepy goblins. LEGO resurrected Diagon Alley as a gift with purchase in 2018. The microscale recreation of Gringotts featured a more accurate three-storey facade. UK designer Justin Ramsden worked on this and the new version. In fact, you can see Justin in the instructions showing the correct way to handle the model. Gringotts was first featured in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which was dumbed down to Sorcerer's Stone for the US market thanks to the publisher Scholastic. It was founded by a goblin named Gringotts in 1474, and if you're lucky you might find Gringotts on a chocolate frog card. The scenes showing the main banking hall from the first movie were actually filmed on location in London at Australia House. It's located at 71 Oldwich, just off Strand and close to Covent Garden. Scenes in later movies were likely filmed on a soundstage at Leavesden Studios in Watford, England. If you ever get a chance to go to the Harry Potter Studio Tour, they do have a really good recreation of Gringotts. Coming full circle, we now have the most detailed and accurate version of Gringotts yet. Before we move on to Gringotts, check out the magical menagerie which helps this set blend into Diagon Alley. LEGO has clearly done their research because this looks very much like the version we see at Leavesden Studios. Outside we find a number of wizarding pets for sale. For reptile lovers we find a couple of rattlesnakes in unusual colours. There's also the obligatory LEGO frog and a young pygmy puff. I hear they're known to sing on Boxing Day. Peeking into the alleyway you can see a couple of hidden posters. It's a real shame that these are hidden away, but we learn that baby pygmy puffs are now in stock. And shock horror, nifflers are sold out! Also hidden from view is a sign saying that the magical menagerie has owls, cats and bats. Also advertising their feline product line, there's an advertising sign at the front of the shop with a statue of a cat. I don't think this sign belongs to the magical menagerie, but I'm sure their feline friends will enjoy the fishy dinners. Peeking in through the window we can see an Ashwinder egg. I guess those snakes outside in the barrel may actually be Ashwinders. Inside we find a sign warning how dangerous these are. There's also a cash register and a pink brush. While there is a detailed interior, LEGO has provided no way for us to see it. There is a minifigure scale door in the alleyway, but no real way to get to it. This set does feature a bunch of stickers, and on the back of the magical menagerie you can see some signs posted. Tucked away in a tunnel underneath the store, there's a nice little easter egg. Here we find a chocolate frog and a chocolate frog card. Alluding to another hidden secret, on the back of the store we find a sign saying fang brushes this way. Remember the pink hairbrush inside the magical menagerie? Yes, it's a fang brush. We find another one of these buried deep within the vaults of Gringotts. This spider and hairbrush is hidden deep within the set and there's no way to get to it. More advertising on the front of the shop encourages us to multiply our fortune with a junior wizard savings account. If only we hadn't spent our fortune on Lego. It isn't totally clear what the space above the magical menagerie is meant to be. I'm guessing this may provide lodgings for travelling wizards or maybe even for the goblins of Gringotts. Referring back to the instructions, you can see that LEGO has put some stuff inside. Check out the bat sitting on a sand green 1x2 jumper. You'll find that same feature on the original Gringotts set. The attic space above is empty except for a golden galleon. We see a lot of these hidden around the set. 
At the base of the building we do see a couple of connection points, which is how I suspect this connects to the rest of Diagon Alley. Even outside of Gringotts, there's some really nice detail, including a cobbled street. This provides some really nice continuity when combining the set with Diagon Alley. Beyond the main entrance on the right hand side is an elaborate gate. This is flanked by some wizarding street furniture. The empty box doesn't make a lot of sense and may just be a distraction from the connection point. The stack of cauldrons, however, does show that LEGO's been paying attention. If you look at the concept art, you do find a stack of cauldrons outside a cauldron shop to the right hand side. I'm not so sure how the wall at the side fits in, but it may make sense when we get future additions. I'm definitely a fan of the architectural detail, even if it does hide a bunch of snot bricks. The alleyway at the side of Gringotts has plenty of decoration. Stickered detail includes a LEGO themed recreation of the Dark Mark, wanted posters for Fenrir Greyback and the boy what Gondon lived, and a worrying warning about the Gringotts banking system being on the verge of collapse. There's also a neat statue built into the walls featuring a stone frog, and a secure side door which might be the staff entrance. As you'd expect with a Wizarding World set, we do get the obligatory owl, or should I say owls. This one is delivering a letter to the goblins, and the other seems to have abandoned some copies of the Daily Prophet. One detail I really do like is the drain pipe which goes down the side of the building. It follows a crooked angle before ending with a translite blue puddle. Taking the opportunity to add another sticker, there's an advert for pumpkin juice high up on the building. All of this detail may be wasted if you choose to use the connection points on the side. While there is some nice masonry detail towards the back of the building, most of the sides are clad in these white tiles. It reminds me of the marble cladding you see on the Taj Mahal. Historically, banks have always been grand buildings. The impressive, secure-looking facade gives customers confidence. Far from being just flat, there is some structure to the exterior. Speaking of structure, can you see what I've done wrong here? What were you thinking, man? Tucked away within the side alley, you can see an impressive stickered door. This has the same architectural detail above, and a convenient lamp so you can see what you're doing. The side door may be familiar if you've ridden the Escape from Gringotts ride at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando, Florida. The upper floors of Gringotts are habitable and we'll take a poke around later. For now you can see we have four stickered windows. The detail on the opposite side elevation is quite similar. The key difference is this cheeky chappy peeking out from behind the curtains. The most impressive part of the bank is of course the frontage. At ground level we have a certain couple of beloved characters in the way. Expelliarmus! The main entrance to Gringotts is designed to both impress and intimidate. Enter stranger but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned beware of finding more than treasure there. The front of the bank is absolutely stunning. It's not quite as rickety as the concept art, but you certainly get the impression this hasn't been built to code. On each level we find a window looking out onto a balcony with railings. I love the way the top window has been mounted on a slant to complete the appearance. Addressing the elephant in the room, there was no way I was going to sticker this to LEGO's instructions. The sticker sheet breaks down Gringotts Bank into two stickers. While I don't advocate for sticking one sticker across two parts, I did trim the stickers to make the effect look a lot better. We will be exploring the roof of the bank, but chronologically this is not the right time. For now, we're turning the clocks back to 1991. About 200,000 turns of your time turner should work. This does present us with a bit of a problem. Whilst Harry can squeeze inside, the great big oaf Hagrid is too big for the doors. We'll soon fix that. Unlike modular buildings, the floors of Gringotts don't come apart. Thankfully you can remove the roof which lets in a little bit of light for filming. The spectacular Gringotts banking hall modelled on Australia House is where Harry Potter first experiences a famous Wizarding World creature. Hagrid? What exactly are these things? They're goblins, Harry. Clever as they come, goblins, but not the most friendly of beasts. Best stay close. The banking hall is a bit of a funny shape compared to the movie. We're used to it being pretty straight with a row of goblins on each side. Apart from the atypical floor plan, all of the details are here. There are elevated desks for the goblin tellers to work at. These are nicely decorative and each one comes with a matching lamp. I love the fact that these have an elevated platform at the back so the goblins can see what's going on. Each has jumper plates to stand on and check out the easter egg underneath this one. It's one of many coins that you will find throughout the bank. The windows are stickered parts but I like the kind of holographic metallic finish. I'm also a big fan of the decorative mosaic floor which was very satisfying to put together. The set does include a bunch of new parts including these rather nice printed columns. These would not have been fun to put stickers onto. Slightly more difficult to film is the other set of bank teller desks on the other side of the banking hall. 
Casting our eyes upwards, we find even more detail. In particular, check out the crystal chandelier. It's not quite as fancy as the one we see in the movie, but this is a more than satisfactory recreation. As well as a crystal chandelier, the pillars are topped out with decorative gold parts. I could mention the broken glass on the floor, but that's a story for later. Overlooking the grand banking hall at Gringotts, we find a slightly less grand balcony. This will be where some of the clerical work takes place, but it also hides some secrets. Those of us that follow the history of Lego Harry Potter might recognise the goblin in the picture. That creepy dead-eyed goblin also appeared in the 4714 Gringotts bank set from 2002. The portrait hangs next to a wall safe, which I happen to know the combination to. Inside we find a printed 1x2 tile which Professor Dumbledore gave to Hagrid to hand to the head goblin. It's about you know what, in vault number you know which. You'll notice the wall into which the safe is set is a little thicker than usual. It's not easy to get inside, but if you're determined... There's a gold statuette and a red coffee mug hidden on a shelf above the safe, hidden deep within inside the wall. I feel sure those long lost artifacts aren't captured on the goblin's ledger. As Griphook says in the final movie, goblins have no need for gold. This is truly evident with the amount they have carelessly lying around. More precious artifacts can be found on the other side, including a stack of gold with a gold goblet, and a chest containing unknown treasures. This contains a bunch of golden galleons and some seemingly random trans orange pieces. This particular galleon is being modelled by young Harry Potter. It's a one by one round printed tile with metallic gold printing featuring a dragon. While the scale may be a little off, the attention to detail is perfect. Wizarding coins come in three different denominations. The most highly valued coin is the Golden Galleon. We then have the Silver Sickle and the Bronze Canut. These would all appear to be minted especially for Gringotts Bank. To make things nice and simple, you get 29 Canuts to a Sickle and 17 Sickles to a Galleon. Man, it would make me sickle just trying to calculate all of that. As if this set couldn't get any better, in the last bag, LEGO included three of these large size printed Galleons. Their suggestion is that we add these to the large LEGO Harry Potter icon set. Saving a visit to the roof for later, I think it's time we went down to the vaults. Mr. Harry Potter wishes to make a withdrawal. And does Mr. Harry Potter have his key? Wait a minute, got it here somewhere. Ah, there's the little devil. None of the goblins included in this set resemble the front desk goblin we saw in the first movie. That goblin was of course played by Warwick Davis. Warwick also plays Professor Flitwick and then magically becomes the goblin Griphook in later movies. To confuse things more, the goblin you see escorting Harry and Hagrid down to the vaults in the first movie is also Griphook. This version of Griphook was played by Vern Troyer who passed away in 2018. Vern was better known as Dr. Evil's mini-me in the Austin Powers movie franchise. He was 2 foot 8 inches tall whilst Warwick towered over him at 3 foot 6. Beneath the Wizarding Bank we find cavernous tunnels which lead miles underground and stretch out beneath the streets of London. To reach the deepest vaults with the most precious and valuable contents, you have to take a minecart. While the minecart in the original Gringotts set had plenty of room for three passengers, this one is a little bit more limited so we'll have to improvise. Oh, that has to hurt. The track, which is an absolutely marvellous invention, is made out of like a roller coaster track. If I remember rightly, this was first introduced with the Joker Manor set. To access the vaults via the subterranean railway, Gringotts Goblins and their guests use these mine carts. Although there are wheels on the side, these are just for show. The actual wheels which run on the tracks are found underneath. These spin freely, allowing the cart to move at speed. As far as we know, the Gringotts minecart only has one speed, and that's too fast for Hagrid. If you look carefully at the LEGO version, you'll notice flanges to stop the cart flying off the track. It's pretty much the same mechanism you see on roller coaster cars. There is a connection point on the back for making a train of carts, but for our purposes we only need one. In terms of capacity for our three minifigures, this falls well short. At least LEGO managed to include the large lamp, which is mounted prominently on the front. As I alluded before, the large wheels on the side are purely decorative. This is actually a set of rims from a LEGO Speed Champions set. Before we go on a wild ride, let's take a moment to appreciate the actual structure of the vaults. Each corner has a raised right angle which keeps the bank firmly in place. Whilst the four arms are mainly practical, they are somewhat decorative. There are some large rock pieces and a nice selection of earthy colours. Another detail you'll notice is that these are dripping in stalactites. How do I know these are stalactites and not stalagmites? Well, tights come down of course. For my American friends, tights are what British people call pantyhose. Of course, being a subterranean cave system, you won't be surprised to find a bat down here. I'm Batman. 
No, not that kind of bat! Getting back to our subterranean adventure, it's time to board the minecart. The minecart station is reached through this sturdy looking door. I say sturdy, but it looks like something's been trying to get out. Everybody ready? Our first stop is vault number 687, which belongs to... You guessed it! Thanks to another sticker, we've arrived at the vault which belonged to Lily and James Potter. Key, please! Much to Harry's surprise, the vault swung open, revealing a large pile of gold. Were James and Lily Potter early investors in Apple? No, they got rich off the family business. Harry's grandparents, Fleamont and Euphemia, created a line of hair care products you may have heard of. This insufferable know-it-all is a big fan of their hair potion. Yes, Fleamont invented the Sleek Easy's line of hair potions and scalp treatments. You didn't think your mom and dad would leave you with nothing now, did you? Helping to make sure we don't miss our stop, there's a really cool mechanism outside of the vault. See what happens when I lift the signal. This causes the train to stop in exactly the right place. Likewise, when it's time to move on, we simply change the signal. It's a simple but effective system which uses gears to raise a physical barrier between the tracks. Our next stop takes us even deeper into the subterranean vault structure. Vault 713 holds a very different secret. Notice how the vault number combines two very significant numbers. Seven is a very powerful magical number, which is why Voldemort split his soul into seven parts. Thirteen is also steeped in superstition. No key this time, just some very powerful goblin magic which seems to involve a lot of hand waving. This special vault, which you can also see at the Harry Potter Studio Tour, is the reason for the top secret letter that Hagrid bought from Dumbledore. In this vault lies a single artifact, the Philosopher's Stone. You can say all you want, but you'll never convince me it's called the Sorcerer's Stone. The Sorcerer's Stone was created by famed alchemist Nicholas Flamel. Thanks for the research, Hermione. Did you know that Nicholas Flamel was actually a real person and an alchemist? He was born in 1330 and died in March 1418. Nicholas Flamel, both in the book and in real life, is credited with discovering the Philosopher's Stone. Does that say Sorcerer's Stone? Ah uh, ah uh, ah! Uh. Anyway, Hagrid takes us back to Hogwarts and all kinds of adventures ensue. I've covered all of that in different videos, so feel free to go check it out. Only one vault remains in the standard incarnation of this set. Unfortunately, Harry, you're going to have to come back in about six years. About 210,000 turns on the Time Turner should do it. Same bank, different day. Thanks to some Polyjuice Potion and goodness knows where they got those costumes, Ron and Hermione have been visually transformed into Dragomir Despard and the evildoer you just have to love, Bellatrix Lestrange. The reason we don't know very much about Dragomir Despard is because Hermione made him up. He was alleged to be a visitor from Transylvania who spoke very little English and was interested in the Dark Lord's plans. Whilst Hermione and Ron transformed using Polyjuice Potion, Harry and Griphook had no such luck, so they had to use Harry's Cloak of Invisibility. Now let me see, where does this appear in the parts list for this set? Okay... Uh-huh... Hmm... Well thanks, Lego! That's gonna make life a little bit difficult. Thankfully for you, my awesome viewers, I just happen to have a spare hanging around. No, not that kind of spare! This section of the movie starts in Freshwater West Beach in Pembrokeshire, Wales. It's where they filmed the scenes for Shell Cottage. This is a real place and you can totally go there and visit Dobby's grave. I heartily recommend the pilgrimage. The deal was that Griphook would receive the Sword of Gryffindor for helping the trio break into the vault of Bellatrix Lestrange. We've seen the Sword of Gryffindor element before, but it is exquisitely detailed. On Harry's instruction, Griphook hands the Sword of Gryffindor to Hermione for safekeeping. Hermione puts the sword in her beaded bag. Thanks to an undetectable extension charm, this bag could hold a lot of stuff. Definitely more than you can hold, backpack! The Lego recreation is simple but very effective. We've got a purple minifigure head with a printed design, and a flower element up on top representing the drawstrings. With all that attended to, the four disapparate and reappear in Nocturne Alley. It's here that Hermitrix or Bellamy greets a stranger with a cheery good morning. Good morning? Good morning? You're Bellatrix Lestrange, not some dewy-eyed schoolgirl! After some cheery conversation about slitting their own throats, and with Harry and Griphook under the cloak of invisibility, the four set off to Gringotts Bank. Uh -huh. I wish to enter my vault. Identification? I hardly think that'll be necessary. Madame Lestrange. I don't like to be kept waiting. Man, talk about entitled. They know. They know she's an imposter. They've been warned! What shall we do, Harry? Madame Lestrange, would you mind presenting your wand? 
And why should I do that? I'm sure you understand given the current climate. No, I most certainly do not understand. I'm afraid I must insist. This is when Harry steps in, raises his wand and mutters Imperio. Bogrod takes a big sniff and smiles. Are you sure that was magic? Very well, Madame Lestrange, if you will follow me. And they are in, racing down the tracks in the same minecart that conveyed Harry and Hagrid years earlier. Okay, so the minecart isn't big enough for five people, but that's the least of their worries. They find themselves hurtling towards the thief's downfall, with Griphook unable to apply the brakes in time. The thief's downfall, picked out in trans blue elements, is a powerful magical waterfall which washes away all enchantments. That includes Polyjuice Potion, and also the Imperious Curse. The cart comes to a halt, and jettisons its passengers high above the deepest part of the vaults. They're saved in the nick of time by Hermione using the Arresto Momentum spell. Stranded, the adventurers consider their next move. Oh no, you look like you again. Way to make a compliment, Ron. What the devil are all of you doing down here? Thieves! Another dose of the Imperious Curse soon puts Bogrod back in his place. In the wider scheme of things, Bogrod turns out to be just a minor inconvenience. Bloody hell, that's a Ukrainian iron belly. More on this little beauty in just a few minutes. While it's generally accepted that the dragon is abused by the goblins, he or she does at least have a regular feeding schedule. I'm a little worried about what or who might be on the menu. While that may be changed, there's also a pitchfork to clean up dragon poop. You'll also notice that down here we have the opposite of stalactites. These point upwards and of course are stalagmites. The other thing we find is a box containing some interesting objects. These are known in the trade as clankers. It's been trained to expect pain when it hears the noise. That's barbaric! Nonetheless, Ron joins in, allowing them to subdue the dragon and sneak past. Finally, they reach the Lestrange Vault. Instead of needing a key, the door to the vault just melts away when Bogrod touches it. It's really cool that LEGO used negative space on a mirrored sticker to represent the minifigure's hand. In the movie, the Lestrange Vault is absolutely full of gold. The LEGO version is a little bit more sparse. We do see some sticker detail in the back, but apart from that, there's just a single golden chalice. For reasons that are revealed later in the movie, the chalice whispers to Harry. At this point, Hermione happens to touch one of the artifacts, and it splits into two. The Gemino Curse. Everything you touch multiplies. As Harry climbs towards the cup, setting off a chain reaction of the Gemino Curse, he commands Griphook to throw him the Sword of Gryffindor. Now, the Gemino effect doesn't really work on LEGO, but we do have a cool action feature. As Harry reaches for the cup, resetting the Gemino Curse action feature is tedious to say the least. It's done by inserting a bunch of Lego goblets through a diamond shape opening at the top of the vault. It's a really neat feature, but once you've reset it a couple of times, it all becomes a bit of a hassle. To cut a long story short, they're all nearly killed by the Gemino Curse, Griphook holds Harry to ransom, forcing him to swap the cup for the sword, and the double-crossing so-and-so leaves them to find their own way out of the vaults. Getting out is not going to be easy, but at least they have the Horcrux. The Horcrux in this case is represented by a simple Lego goblet. The real thing was created by Helga Hufflepuff and was rather more elaborate. It came with two finely wrought handles and was decorated with a badger, the lame symbol of Hufflepuff House. I mean, come on. Gryffindor had a lion, Slytherin had fricking snakes, even Ravenclaw could manage an eagle, and those lame Hufflepuffs came up with a badger. With Griphook gone and Bogrod still delirious from the Imperious Curse, the next challenge for the trio was going to be getting past the Ukrainian Iron Belly. For one of the visitors to the vault, this was going to be his last adventure. Oh, that's unfortunate. The others were forced to make a literal leap of faith onto the back of the Ukrainian Iron Belly. Seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, it scaled the sheer rock face of the cavern containing the vaults, and emerged through the floor of the bank scaring the bejeebus out of the goblins. Finally, it broke through the glass dome on the top of Gringotts, which this bank doesn't have, and took a couple of moments to catch its breath. Perched on top of the roof of the bank, the Ukrainian Iron Belly makes for a very impressive sight indeed. You can see something very similar at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando, Florida. I think it would be very rude not to use some of my B-roll here. To keep the dragon securely connected, there are a couple of clips on the side of the feet, and corresponding bars on top of the dome. It allows you to give the dragon a very dynamic pose without the risk of it falling off. 
The dragon's head is faithfully decorated, even down to the scars on the face and the cataracts in the eyes. The hinged mouth opens to reveal a very nice dual molded flame element. Like the version we saw in the movie, the Ukrainian iron belly is covered in spines. The wings in particular are really nicely crafted and made of soft fabric. These attach to a jointed skeletal frame. As you can fold the wings up, it allows for even more display possibilities. Personally, I prefer to see them fully outstretched. Despite multiple points of articulation, it is quite difficult to get it to stand on its own. The hips are mounted on a ratchet joint, which gives it plenty of movement, and then the ankles are on a ball joint. To top that off, we have three claws, which can be independently posed. Providing some counterbalance, the tail has five different points of articulation. Remnants of chain can be found around the dragon's neck, and more chains hang from the feet. Not even the dragon can escape the curse of the sticker sheet with some thorny detail along the side. The dragon takes an already superb Lego set and dials the volume up to 11 on awesomeness. This is by no means perfect, but if you're really careful, you can get Harry, Ron and Hermione on the dragon's back. They have places to go and people to see, but we need to wrap up our tour of Gringotts. Our last port of call is of course the roof. Although the hole in the roof clearly isn't dragon sized, we do have some damage up here. The skylight is missing a pane and there are shards of glass everywhere. The sand green roof and dome are a nice throwback to the early Harry Potter sets. The colour choice is almost perfect for the dome on top of the bank. Technically this should be tarnished copper. Without the dragon, we get a closer look at the decoration up on top of the dome. Notice that this includes two bar elements for the dragon's feet to clip to. The dome is removable and reveals some secrets. There's a desk inside with some more interesting paperwork, some more treasures carelessly littering the floor, and blackboards with mysterious secrets. The first chalkboard is pretty easy to understand and shows the minecarts below Gringotts. If I'm not mistaken, that's the minecart from the very first Gringotts set. This cryptic tile gives us an introduction to Roman numerals. I equals 1, XVII equals 17, and CD LXI equals 461. This tells us that one golden galleon is equivalent to 17 silver sickles and 461 bronze canuts. Sticking with Roman numerals, things get even more cryptic. MMMMDCCXIV is the Roman numeral for 4714. 4714 is the original Gringotts bank set from 2002. XCCXVII doesn't really translate. Notice there's a symbol above the X. X translates into 10 and CCXVII translates into 217. Put them together and this relates to the 10217 Diagon Alley set, which also featured Gringotts from 2011. In third position, XL translates to 40. CCL XXXIV translates to number 289. Put them together and we have the 40289 Diagon Alley set from 2018. Next we either have a typo or Lego is messing with our heads. LXX is a Roman numeral for 70. CDXVII is 417. There is no Lego set 70417. This set however is 76417. Maybe Lego isn't as smart as they thought they were. Finally we have a 2x2 two two printed tile which I don't understand at all. Maybe it's some kind of diagram of Gringotts, or maybe that character on the right is some kind of ancient rune. If you do know what this means then please do let me know in the comments. As if there weren't enough reasons already to love this set, we have a grand total of 13 minifigures to take a look at. Young Harry Potter, Rubius Hagrid, Bellatrix Lestrange who transforms into Hermione, Dragomir Despar who changes into Ron, Older Harry Potter, Griphook, Bogrod, Rickbutt, Generic Goblin number 1 and number 2, a generic Death Eater, and two Gringotts guards with differing skin colour. Starting with the goblins, this is Griphook as played by Warwick Davis in the last two movies. Lego has done a really nice job here matching the minifigure to the character in the movie. Being of short stature, Griphook has the small child sized legs. The torso print is new for this set and matches the costume perfectly. The printed stripes on the arms show really nice attention to detail. Those stripes do fade out because of the limitations of Lego minifigure printing. I forgot to mention this lantern when we were down in the vaults. This appeared in the first movie and was on the back of the minecart. The facial expression is really nicely done, but definitely doesn't come across as trustworthy. Switching from a twisted smile to a sullen face makes him look even less trustworthy. The printed head is new for this set. One thing I love about the goblins are the printed hair elements with incorporated ears. These are dual molded, which makes for a very crisp finish. Dressed slightly more formally, this is Rickbert, the head goblin bank teller. The printed torso element is new, but we will see this again later. 
the main facial expression is calm and benign, but turns into something positively evil. This is a new but not exclusive facial print. You'll be seeing this again. Also in a new colourway with the white hair is the dual moulded hairpiece. If it wasn't for that face not being quite right, this would be an almost perfect Rickbit. Sharing the same hairpiece, this is Bogrod, who has by far my favourite name of all the goblins. Bogrod is looking rather dapper in a dark bluish grey pinstripe suit. It's not exactly the same as we see in the movie, but it's a good approximation. The pinstripe detail is really crisp, even on the back of the torso. It's a new printed element for this character, but I'm sure we'll see LEGO use this again. Also new and exclusive to this character is the facial print. The details are great, even down to the glasses. But what I love is the alternate expression showing Bogrod after he's been roasted by the dragon. This elevates the minifigure to a whole new level. The other two goblins aren't important enough to have their own names. We shall call them Sparkmac and Mogglewog. They both wear the same very smart suit. The torso print is new and incorporates some really nice gold metallic detail for the pocket watch chain. The dual moulded arms are an intriguing detail. I'm not certain why we have the shirt sleeves at the top and then dark detail at the bottom. The dual moulded ginger hair and ears combination is a new colourway for this element. It's also really useful for recreating one of the more generic goblins from Deathly Hallows Part 2. The facial print is exclusive at this time and quite unusual. The alternate expression which has an air of evil also includes spectacles. Well, none of us are getting any younger. The other goblin has a facial print which you might recognise. This was also used for the Rickbert character. Also being reused is the hair and ears element that we saw on Griphook. The goblin lineup in this set is very impressive. It provides a wide variety of parts for us to construct our own goblin creations. Just don't have nightmares. There is another goblin to come, but more about him soon. For now, let's focus on Hagrid and little Ari. Hagrid is a great minifigure, if indeed you can call him a minifigure. The disappointing thing is that this version of Hagrid has been used since 2018. He first appeared in 75954 Hogwarts Great Hall, and was reprised in 2019 with the 75947 Hagrid's Hut Buckbeak's Rescue. In 2002 we got him in the 75978 Diagon Alley set, and finally he appears in the 75423 Hogwarts Express and Hogmeade Station set. That's on my extensive filming backlog. Fitting in perfectly with the Philosopher's Stone movie, Hagrid has his pink umbrella. This conceals remnants of the magic wand which Hagrid isn't supposed to have. It's a very good representation of the character from the movie, but I'm a little disappointed that we don't have something new here. I have similar sentiments about Harry Potter, who looks very similar to the one we got in the large-scale Diagon Alley set. The only difference is the printed head, which also appeared in 76423 Hogwarts Express and Hogsmeade Station. It is a really nice recreation of the boy wizard as shown in the Philosopher's Stone. The torso print, which is recycled, shows Harry wearing Dudley's old clothes, which are about three times too big for him. It's great to have Harry and Hagrid to recreate the early scenes of the movie. I'm just a little disappointed that we didn't get some alternate versions of these goblins to match the earlier movie. One day, maybe we will get a Vern Troyer version of Griphook. Turning our attention away from A-list characters for just a moment, the set includes two security guards from Gringotts Bank. You'll remember seeing these uniformed officers during the scene where Bellatrix is trying to access her vault. One noticeable difference here is the inclusion of diversity. I'm pretty sure the security guards shown in the movie were white men, but a lot of time has passed since 2001. Not that we should assume gender identity. Oh god, there goes the comments again. It does appear we have a woman of colour guarding the bank. Like any self-respecting witch or wizard, or whatever they call themselves these days, each of the security guards comes with a black wand. The uniform consists of dark blue pants, a printed torso, and a dark blue hat. Both guards come with the same printed torso design, which has some really nice metallic accents. The printed detail is crisp and clean, and identical on both guards. These are catalogued as different torso elements, on account of the different skin colours for the hands. The facial prints are not exclusive, and have been used on other minifigures. As the hats do not cover the back of the heads, we only have one facial expression. I'm pleased to see the guards included, as they are a small but integral part of the story. Likewise, we should have probably got Voldemort and a bunch of goblin body parts. The second Harry minifigure ages him by about six years. Harry comes equipped with a wand and a facial expression which suggests he may be about to use it. The legs are a generic sand blue part, but we do have a nice printed torso complete with metallic details for Harry's hoodie. From the back you can see the hood and the plaid shirt peeking out from underneath. 
It's not a difficult or elaborate costume to recreate, and the designers have done an okay job. The facial print is exclusive to this set, but this is not my favourite expression. I much prefer the wet face we see after Harry has been plunged into the thief's downfall. This is not one of the standout minifigures from the set, but LEGO has done a good job with the material they had to work with. Before we get to the stars of the show, let's take a look at this oddity. This is of course one of Lord Voldemort's Death Eaters, but does not appear to my memory in any scenes involving Gringotts Bank. The printed detail on the legs lines up very nicely with the torso print. Especially impressive when you realise these legs have been used in 14 minifigures. The printed torso is exclusive and includes a little metallic detail for the belt. The torso has more printed detail around the back and incorporates grey arms and black hands. The head is exclusive to this character and includes some really nice metallic printing on a black background. Each of the designs has been printed really nicely and pops on that black background. The hood is not new but perfectly complements the character. I'm still unclear as to why there is a Death Eater in this set, but if you were looking for a great example of a Death Eater minifigure then here it is. Saving the best for last we get 4 minifigures for the price of 2. Dragomir Despar, as you'll recall, is an alter ego for Ron made up by Hermione Granger. He was described as being a Transylvanian wizard who spoke very little English. Very convenient for avoiding awkward questions. Saving a little money you'll note that Dragomir has the same printed legs as the Death Eater. The printed torso is exclusive and boy do those metallic details pop against the black. More printing on the back of the torso picks out a couple of folds and the hood of the robes. Lego's attention to detail in bringing Dragomir to life in minifigure form is very very good indeed. I don't know where Hermione got the hairs to make this polyjuice potion, but it's super convenient that Dragomir looks very much like Ron. If my memory serves me right, the hair is a little shorter than it appeared in the movie. It's an existing mould but does appear for the first time in this new colourway. Also unsurprisingly exclusive is the facial print. Do I hear the thief's downfall approaching? This character comes with alternate hair and alternate face. As you can see, Dragomir has transformed back into Ron. While this is most definitely Ron, I do kind of prefer him as Dragomir. Next we have Hermione Granger transformed by Polyjuice Potion into Bellatrix Lestrange. It was really good fun in the movie watching Helena Bonham Carter play Emma Watson trying to play Helena Bonham Carter. This lady is an absolute top notch actor. Everything you see here with the exception of the hair is new for this set. The bottom of the robes have some really nice but subtle metallic details. What makes this extra special is that LEGO has actually printed the curved part on the back. The printed detail is absolutely stunning and beautifully recreates the character we saw in the movie. The hair, which has been used for other Bellatrix the Strange minifigures, is absolutely perfect. Equally satisfying is the terrifying face of Bellatrix the Strange. Like Ron, we have an alternate expression covered in moisture and alternate hair which shows a very bedraggled Hermione. The alternate appearance of a wet Hermione is equally satisfying. I'm very tempted to get another set of minifigures so I can display both variants. The hair is not a new mould, but this is the first time in this reddish brown colourway. I'm a big fan of these two minifigures in both of their forms. They've been a great deal of fun to film with and I hope you enjoyed the little storyline. Now I know that this video is running a little long, but I did promise to share some bonus material. This is the 40598 Gringotts Vault set, which was a free gift with purchase. Thankfully I have a couple of these, so I don't mind opening one for you guys. It's a 212 piece set and you can pick one up from sites like eBay or Bricklink for about $40. This adds an extra vault to the track and makes the whole thing a little bit more awkward to display. As you can see on the back of the box, this is very much designed to go with the Gringotts Bank set. Interestingly, you can also use this as a money box for your savings, but being a serious LEGO collector, I don't have any. Let's check out what's inside this little beauty. It's pretty much what we'd expect. We've got four numbered bags of Lego, a single section of train track for the cart, a 78 page instruction booklet, an 8x8 perforated plate, and the dreaded sticker sheet which refuses to lie flat. I'm going to put this together and then we'll see how it looks connected to Gringotts.
So here is the small but perfectly formed 40598 Gringotts Vault set. It contains exactly the same minecart we got with the Gringotts Bank set. Except this one has its wheels on the right way round. Seriously guys, when were you going to tell me? We also have the same system of track and connection points here and here. I could pretend that I hadn't noticed the same on the big set, but you know where this is going. Where the track ends, we find a removable buffer. We can also remove a part from here, and then we can snap the whole thing together. This does leave a bit of a gap between the tracks, and I don't recall getting a spare part for this. Thankfully, I've got a few 2x2 tiles lying around. The interesting thing, and I can see what you did here, Lego, is that you can connect more of these vaults to the set. I think you could pretty much go on indefinitely with this. The panel element at the end of the track isn't quite as impressive as the buffer we just removed, but I am pleased to confirm that it does the trick. This new vault is styled similarly and has no vault number. This sticker detail can also be found on the vault of Madame Lestrange. The design is very similar and also features an opening door. Unlike the other vaults, this one is completely empty. A unique and interesting design feature of this vault is the slot up on top. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Maybe LEGO had a different idea for these coins after all. Now you could try and fish the coins out via the vault door, but frankly my fingers aren't long enough. Instead, LEGO included a removable panel on the back. So as not to spoil the magic, there's even a ladder on the inside of the vault. As I mentioned at the top of the video, this set comes with a goblin which is technically exclusive. He comes with one of the printed galleon tiles which we find littered around Gringotts. Now when I say exclusive, I am stretching the truth a little here. The legs are a standard element, you'll definitely remember the torso from the Rickbert minifigure, and that evil face was also featured on one of the generic goblins. Sticking with this predictable theme, you will recognise the hair element also. Why reinvent the wheel when we have something perfectly serviceable? It's the 40598 Gringotts Vault set, an essential add-on to the Gringotts Bank set. Honestly, no, but I'm glad I've got it. Of course, the bigger question is, is Gringotts Bank an essential part of the Diagon Alley set? Now there's a question we need to answer. Switching to the fancy wide-angle lens, this is by far the best way to display this. Set at a right angle, you get a really good view of Diagon Alley as it dovetails into Gringotts Bank. The other nice feature is that you get really nice continuity when it comes to the cobblestones. It makes for a beautiful and immersive display, especially when you add the dragon on top. But of course, for most people, me included, this is horribly impractical. Setting these buildings at a right angle is incredibly space intensive. Setting all the buildings out in a row is definitely the most practical option. Even so, you'll need more than 50 inches of shelf space and that shelf must be at least 10 inches deep. Gringotts is built more like a modular whilst the other buildings are on half plates. This means that Gringotts juts out and that's why we have an archway to continue into the rest of Diagon Alley. The end result is by far the most immersive version of Diagon Alley that LEGO has ever made and probably ever will. I think somebody at LEGO just said, hold my beer. Thankfully, I spent most of my January working on display space in the basement, and I have just the place to display this. For the most part, I have every LEGO Harry Potter set sorted into chronological order. There are some exceptions due to size, but thankfully the dream is becoming a reality. After months of waiting, the Ultimate Gringotts Bank became a reality for me, and I couldn't be happier with the result. If you're still on the fence about buying this, then definitely go push the button. It's everything I expected and more. Not only did this take a long time to build, it also took a lot of time to script, film and edit. I hope it was worth the wait and now I'm going to knock out some smaller sets from the latest wave. If you did enjoy the video then a thumbs up is always appreciated and don't forget to subscribe for more LEGO Harry Potter awesomeness. Thanks a million for checking out my Ultimate Gringotts Bank review, stay safe and I'll see you on the next video.